Bruce Delting is our next speaker. He's a preacher at the Fish Hatchery Road Church of Christ. Uh, certainly a congregation that the, uh, the Spring Congregation is not only very familiar with, they're uh, certainly a very close congregation as we have a lot of members that uh, attend there and members of theirs that come here quite often. Um, we certainly appreciate them and the stand that they take for the truth and for the good preachers they have there in Bruce. Um, he was certainly, um, I have no fear about Bruce getting up here and speaking to us. I know that what we hear will be a good lesson. I know it will be a faithful lesson from God's word. He's uh, actually a native born Texan. I didn't know that. I don't know where Corn City is. But I think it's near the carnival or what? Nobody else does either. Okay. <laughs> the only people that know where it is are those that were born there. I know where it is. <laughs> uh, anyway. <laughs> well, let's just say, uh, he's currently working with the Fish Hatchery uh, Road Church of Christ in Huntsville. He's uh, been there since 2001. He also serves there as one of the elders, so certainly have an appreciation for the work that he does in, in that capacity. Uh, he's done mission work in the Philippines and Cambodia. He holds gospel meetings, speaks on several lectureships, has conducted uh, campaigns in Oklahoma, Kansas, Missouri, worked with uh, several Bible youth camps, including uh, the youth camp that we have uh, had the last few summers and the Lord willing we'll have again this summer. Um, so we certainly appreciate him for the work that he does in the Lord's uh, vineyard. But uh, Bruce is going to come and speak to us and on the topic of our faithful children of God found in the denominations. Bruce. Well, I'm sure glad Ken didn't introduce me. He's got David and Dub half in the grave already, counting the days. And I didn't want to be in that number. There's a lot of things I'd like to share with David and Dub, but being old and gray and on the way out isn't one of them. <laughs> Appreciate it. That, that's what he's saying. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just saying. Topic assigned to me. Are there faithful Christians in denominations? I think Jack said children of God, same idea, Christians. Faithful. Notice the title of the lesson. It's not are there Christians in denominations, but are there faithful Christians in denominations? And there's a big difference in that. Um, and you know, simply put, this is a yes or no answer. It's either yes or no, it can't be both. And without reservation or fear of contradiction, I'll tell you right up front, the answer is no. There are no faithful Christians in denominations. This answer is not popular. And in fact, it will make some people outright angry just to hear you say that. And sadly, even among our own brethren, they will become angry at that answer. Paul's statement to the church at Ephesus makes it abundantly clear that there is one God, one Lord, one spirit, one faith, one baptism, one body, and one hope, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. Yet in spite of these facts, some people uh, just adamantly affirm that there are many churches... Each of these churches is just as good as any other church. And in fact, many claim that one can be a Christian without being in any church at all. In fact, and sadly, some in the Lord's church would agree with this. They do so in contradiction to the fact that the Bible plainly teaches that there is one and only one church that is approved by God. And uh, that being the Lord's church, the church revealed on the pages of the New Testament. There is no scriptural authority for anyone to proclaim that there are many churches and any one of them is just as good as any other. In fact, Jesus died and purchased with his precious blood the one church that he promised to build. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. Singular, 
He purchased it with his blood, Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. When we think about this lesson, I want to talk about some things that, that really are cause for concern among faithful brethren in the Lord's church today. As stated uh, earlier in this lesson, the answer to our title question is no, and a resounding no. However, if you ask those people in the denominational world, what do you think they're going to say? They're going to say yes. There are faithful Christians in the denomination. Unfortunately, if you ask some of our own brethren, they're going to say yes too. They're going to agree with the people in the denominations. There have been many attempts made over the past few decades. In fact, since really the, the division between the Lord's church and the Christian church to restore fellowship with that denomination. Obviously a denomination now, back then, erring brethren, but the fruit of those erring brethren uh, ended up just another denomination among denominations. And so we have the Christian church, the more liberal disciples of Christ. And since that time, efforts have been made among our brethren to extend fellowship to denominations. Take, for example, Marvin Phillips, who served as, on the editorial staff of the One Body magazine that was founded by Don DeWalt, a well-known Christian church preacher. Many of those still involved with this magazine are members of the Christian church. Now, Brother Phillips <coughs> also served as an adjunct professor to the Kentucky Christian College, uh, which is associated with the Christian church. Now, in his book, Don't Shoot, We May Be on the Same Side, Brother Phillips made reference to Don DeWell, member Christian church preacher. And he said this, We may disagree on a few things, but I know if Don DeWell and I found ourselves together in the same town, we would find a way to worship God together. I'm happy to count him my brother in Christ. That's page 39 of his book. It's abundantly clear that Marvin Phillips believes that there are faithful uh, Christians in the Christian church denomination. F. Lagarde Smith, another man. Again, I'm using these examples because these men are really influential in uh, the brotherhood or have been for uh, a good number of years. Uh, F. Lagarde Smith, a teacher in different Bible colleges and propagates his error uh, wherever he goes. Uh, he takes this error to the next step in his book, Baptism, the Believer's Wedding Ceremony, Brother Smith lets us know what he thinks about the necessity of being baptized. On page 93, he says, but someone will ask, suppose a person dies uh, after becoming or, or becoming to believe in Christ, but before the time he is to be baptized. In other words, he's a believer, but he's not yet obeyed the gospel. And this is the same old uh, denominational question they asked us in debates on the essentiality of baptism since day one. He says, he asked the question, does that mean he would not be saved? As with every other question dealing with man's salvation, only the God of all judgment can answer that for us. In other words, only God knows. We can't come to an understanding of that. He says, I would be neither surprised nor disappointed if God were to save in this situation. God is a merciful God, but what God may or may not do in that situation doesn't give us room to make baptism anything less than what Christ intended it to be. An essential part of our response to his divine initiative, whatever that means. But we go on. Page 200, he goes on and says this. Do faithful believers, notice what he says. Do faithful believers who were baptized only as infants stand in eternal jeopardy? Do you understand what he's saying there? He's saying people who were baptized as infants are faithful believers. That's the implication of that. And he asks, are they standing in eternal jeopardy? Are those who have committed their lives in faithful service to Jesus Christ, but who have not been taught the need of, for water baptism spiritually lost? Can it be that those who see baptism as a matter of, of uh, ordinance, but not of salvation, are risking God's judgment? 
The thought concerning uh, uh, of condemning to hell the vast majority of believers throughout the, uh, the Christian centuries is one of the most compelling reasons for the recent moratorium on any serious discussion of baptism. That's page 200. And so he's, he's saying someone can be a faithful Christian, a faithful believer, and only be baptized as an infant. And we can't, again, determine whether they're saved or lost. None of us, he says in, verse, in, in page 201, none of us can presume to know about the eternal destiny of anyone on the basis of any question of doctrine. Be it predestination, charismatic gifts, the washing of feet, or even baptism. All we can do is give our best effort to knowing God's will as revealed in his written word. And so he's saying we can't determine somebody's eternal destiny based on doctrine. Well, if we can't determine it based on doctrine, what are we going to determine it on? You see, again, just trying to extend fellowship as broad and as far as he can. You know, I, I've been preaching for about 25 years, served as an elder for about six years, five or six years now. And one of the things that I've noticed is that most error that comes about in the Lord's church, either directly or indirectly, is related to fellowship. Most people go into error in order to broaden fellowship. To extend fellowship where God restricts it. And he goes on. Page 206. Are unbaptized believers. Unbaptized believers. Destined to hell. Are those who have received only infant baptism. In eternal jeopardy. Only God knows. On one level. These are questions we have no right even to ask. Think about that. We don't have a right to ask whether somebody's in eternal jeopardy. How are we going to determine who to preach the gospel to? If we, if we can't determine whether they're lost or saved, how are we going to restore, restore the erring if we can't determine and it's not even right to ask or even consider whether they're lost or saved? How can we do those things? You see... Again, it's just, it doesn't make any sense when you line it up with the scriptures. As seen in this study, he says, there is an abundance of scriptural language that on its face regarding, regards baptism as an essential part of our turning to God. Nevertheless, I would hope, now get this, this is just lame. Nevertheless, uh, like the rest of this isn't lame too. Nevertheless, I would hope that God might apply the common law marriage approach for those who have lived a lifetime of service in his name without having participated in the wedding ceremony of baptism, page 206. You know, I remember somewhere that Jesus said, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever does... The will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day. Have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out demons. In thy name done many wonderful works. You see those are the ones. That brother Smith is talking about. That have lived a lifetime. In service to God. But haven't. Kept his commandments. And I will say to them. On that day. Depart from me, ye worker of iniquity, I never knew you. What sad words, what false hope that the denominational world is giving, and not only that, but some of our own brethren are offering that same false hope. You say. It's obvious then that Brother Smith teaches that they're faithful Christians and denominator and denominations. Furthermore, uh, in his book, Who is My Brother? That's another interesting work. Smith advocates five levels of fellowship, and his purpose in that work is to extend fellowship beyond the scriptural limits to include those in denomination, at least on some level. 
The list could go on. But the foregoing uh, quotations are sufficient to show that there are members of the Lord's church, those among us, who are trying to extend fellowship to those outside the Lord's church, those in denominations. In fact, the last couple of years, uh, the Contending for the Lace uh, Faith Lectureship has dealt with various books written by some of our brethren on this very issue. They're trying for the, the life of them to get fellowship with those outside the Lord's church. Uh, the authors of the books that were reviewed over the last couple of years have been correctly labeled change agents. Some of them have never been satisfied with the Lord's church, and they acknowledge that in the books that they write. From a child, they've not been satisfied. They grew up, they're disgruntled, they don't like the Lord's church. And so they want to change it. They want to make it over into something that suits them. And basically what they want to do is turn the Lord's church into just another denomination among denominations. While many of these men have gone to great lengths and vain, vain attempts uh, to try to support their ideas, their views, their false doctrines from the scriptures, many have left the scriptures behind and no longer try to seek uh, scriptural justifications for what they're doing. They're just going to go out and do it. Of course, they do so at their own jeopardy and the jeopardy of those that follow them. Such men are those of whom Paul made reference when he said, And with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not a love for the truth, that they might be saved, and for this cause God will send them strong delusions that they, may, that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. There are a lot of people that are believing the lie, the strong delusion that God sent them. And obvious, the, the, the eternal destiny that awaits them. So what is a faithful Christian? Before we can find out whether they're faithful Christians in denominations, we have to ask the question, what is a faithful Christian? And of course, it's not possible to be comprehensive in our study because of time constraints and, or in the manuscript because of space limitations. But we're going to do the best we can. Those who live for the Lord are called by different terms in the scriptures. Such terms are brethren, saints, disciples, children of God, and, and among other terms. But perhaps uh, the term that best suits and best describes the followers of Christ is the word Christian. The word Christian comes from the Greek word Christianos, which uh, signifies a follower of Jesus. And that's according to Thayer, page 672. Thus the term denotes one that is of Christ or that belongs to Christ. The word Christian is only found three times in the Bible, and it's never an adjective. It's always a noun and is descriptive of the individuals who follow Jesus. In response to Paul's preaching, King Agrippa said, Almost thou persuadest me to become a Christian. Peter encouraged his readers, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 16. There are those who suggest that the term Christian originally was a term of derision. I don't subscribe to that. Even uh, when we think about Peter's use of this term in the context, it was based on what other people would think of them as a Christian, suffering as a Christian. When we think about this idea of the word Christian, there is evidence that God uh, had chosen prophetically to call his people by the name of his son. And that goes back to Isaiah uh, chapter 62 and verse 2. Isaiah said, The Gentiles shall see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will name. Isaiah 62 and verse 2. Well, along about Acts chapter 11 in verse 26, when Paul finally uh, is found by Barnabas, they end up in Antioch and, and they begin working at the church at Antioch. This is the first uh, congregation that includes uh, Gentiles. Remember, when the Gentiles name the name of the Lord, that's when this new name is going to come. And guess what? 
the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. And that word called there is divinely called, actually, in the Greek language. We learn from the, uh, from the foregoing of these references, these three things. Those uh, in the world referred to the early disciples as Christians. The name Christian was recognized and used by King Agrippa, a man in a seat of authority. And the name Christian was utilized uh, and authorized by Peter, a divinely inspired apostle. And we conclude from the divine origin of this word, we who are followers of Jesus Christ prefer it to any other man-made designation that's out there. You know, a lot of times you ask somebody what they are, they would say, well, I'm a Methodist, or I'm a Baptist, or I'm a Catholic. Well, I'm just a Christian, and that's all I ever want to be. I don't want to be a hyphenated Christian. I don't want to be a Methodist Christian or a Baptist Christian, as some would say. I just want to be a Christian. I want to be what they were in the first century. The New Testament teaches that those who are disciples of Christ are Christians. And it's significant to notice that the disciples were called Christians. So what's a disciple? A disciple is a learner or a pupil or, of course, a disciple. One who learns with the purpose of becoming like the master. That's what a disciple is. Jesus stated the disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Luke chapter 6 and verse 40. Thus a disciple is one who learns and follows the will of the master. In this case, for the purpose of this study, it's Jesus who described this concept when he said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. John 10 and verse 27. This concept has always involved more than simple belief or mental ascent. A, a sinner becomes a disciple or a Christian through the process of reasoning and discernment and obedience. Jesus stated, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. And I will rise him up, raise him up in the last day. It is written in the prophets and they shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that has heard and has learned of the Father comes unto me. John chapter 6, verse 44 through 46. There you have the principle of becoming a disciple and therefore a Christian. You, you're taught and you obey. You follow Jesus. However, in response to Jesus' teaching, many, it says, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? From that time on, many of his disciples went back and walked no longer with him. John 6, verse 60 and 66. Jesus watched as the crowds departed. And they part departed not because they didn't understand what he taught. They, start they departed because they did understand. They knew what he said. And they didn't like what he said. And so they turn from him. And I'll tell you what, friends and brethren, whether we want to realize it or not, that's the principle behind every denomination in the world. Somebody, somewhere, didn't like what the Bible said and went off on their own. They stopped following Jesus and started doing their own thing. And by the way, what did Jesus do when that happened? Did he run after him and say, oh, wait a minute, you misunderstood what I said? Did he soften the message? Did he compromise? Did he plead for him to come back? No, he didn't do any of those things. He turned to the twelve and he said, will you depart also? And you know what Peter said, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of life. Peter understood. And so should we. How would a Christian get into a denomination? How is that possible? Well, it's only one of two ways. Somebody, a Christian could enter a denomination by uh, obeying denomina uh, denominational doctrine. That's one way. Or one could become a Christian and then later join a denomination. And consequently, we must then be concerned with the question, how does one become a Christian? In answer to this question, again, I state unequivocally, and without fear of contradiction, that the Bible only makes Christians only and the only Christians. 
Now, this statement comes from the title of a book by, a book by Brother Thomas Warren. And, you know, this is a scriptural principle, not because it's the title of Brother Warren's book, but because it's taught in the Bible. You know, think about it. If you take the, the Methodist discipline and you study that, you're going to make what? You're going to come out and be a good Methodist. But you're not going to be a Christian. If you take uh, the, the Baptist handbook, the Baptist manual, and you study that, what are you going to end up with? You're going to end up with a good Baptist. But you're not going to end up with a Christian. If you take the Catholic catechism and you study that, what are you going to end up with? Well, you end up with a good Catholic, but not a Christian. Those books are not designed to make Christians. Those books are designed to make members of denominations. Only the Bible can make a Christian and the Bible makes the only Christians. <clears throat> when we think about this, this idea that Jesus talked about, about those that come to him must be taught. Taught what? Taught some denominational doctrine? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 8 and 9, This people draws nigh to me with their mouth, but their heart is far from me. And what happens? Their worship is vain because they teach for their doctrine the commandments of men. And that's a denominational world right there. Their worship is vain. They cannot produce Christians. They can produce denominational members. For when we think about this, no denomination can produce a Christian. Only the Bible can produce a Christian. So in summary, when we think about becoming a Christian, a person, a sinner becomes a Christian by believing in Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 8 and verse 24, except you believe that I am he, you'll die in your sins. That's pretty plain, isn't it? That doesn't need any explanation. In order to be saved, in order not to die in our sins, we have to believe in Jesus. Well, is that all we have to do? You know, we think about the, the New Testament. The New Testament was written, especially the gospel accounts of the life of Christ, were written to prove that Jesus was the Christ. Isn't that what John said in John 20, verse 30 and 31? But faith alone is not sufficient. You know, if I believe in Jesus Christ, I'm going to do what he says. I'm going to do what he says. It's that simple. And so when I come to passages like Luke chapter 13 and verse 3 that says, except you repent, you'll all likewise perish. I'm going to take that serious. Except you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Now, if I'm in an airplane flying at 30,000 feet and the pilot comes on and says, except you abide in the airplane, you're going to perish. What am I going to do? I'm going to make sure I don't get out of the plane, right? That's exactly right. So accept, we understand accept when we apply it to other things. Except you repent, you'll likewise perish. Does that sound like repentance has anything to do with my salvation and becoming a Christian? Absolutely. We also need to confess our faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32, Whosoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. Does that sound like a good thing? Well, look at the other side of that coin. Whosoever denies me before men, him will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. The Ethiopian nobleman in Acts chapter 8, in along about verse 37, made that good confession. He said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And at that point, he was baptized. Why do you think he was baptized? And I asked that question because Philip was teaching him about Jesus. And all of a sudden, they're going along, and the Ethiopian says, See, here's water. What does hinder me to be baptized? Why would he ask that question? He was asked that question because when we teach Jesus, we teach baptism. It goes hand in hand. You can't separate teaching Jesus from teaching about baptism. That's why he said, Here's water. What hinders me to be baptized? And he said, well, do you believe? And then he made that good confession. They stopped the chariot. They went down. Oh, by the way, I remember a Methodist preacher one time said that, well, th what the Ethiopian was doing, they was going through a desert place. And so he reached under the seat of the, of the chariot, the wagon they was in, and he went, brought out a, wa a, a water bottle and said, see, here's water. What does hinder me to be baptized? And the emphasis was he was going to sprinkle or pour some water on him. 
But it doesn't say that. They stopped the chariot. They got out of the chariot. They went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch. They went down in that water bottle. No. <laughs> they went down in the water and he immersed him. That's what the word means. And he came up out of the water and he went on his way rejoicing. Why? Because his sins were washed away. Acts 22 and verse 16. Having been baptized, the Lord added him to the church, Acts 2 and verse 47. He didn't add him into a denomination because there were none. They didn't come along until hundreds of years later. The Ethiopian, when he was baptized, was added by the Lord to his church, the one he promised to build, the one he purchased with his blood, the one he promised to save, Ephesians 5 and verse 23. That's right. And then... As a Christian, we need to live a life in harmony with the teaching of Jesus Christ. John 8 and verse 12. John writes, Whosoever goes onward abides not in the teaching or doctrine of Christ, has not God. He that abides in the doctrine, and the same as both the Father and the Son. Now we're getting the idea that there is more to being a Christian than being just a good person. Or doing something in the name of the Lord. Or being religious. Or following some man-made doctrine. A Christian is one who is a disciple, a learner of Christ. Acts 11 and verse 26. He's an obedient child. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 13 and following. Verse 16 in that context. He is holy. His life is a sermon. 1 Peter 2 and verse 11. A Christian is one who resists the devil, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, and holds fast that which is good and abstains from every form of evil, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21 and 22. A Christian is one who hates sin, Psalm 1 and verse 1. He is one who fears God and keeps his commandments, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. He is upright, Psalm 106 and verse 3. Following denominational teaching cannot produce a faithful Christian. Thus, the only other possible way for a faithful Christian to be in a denomination is for him to become a Christian and then go out and join a denomination after his conversion. While it's possible for one to do that, in doing so, he ceases to be a faithful Christian and goes into apostasy. And is need, in need of his brethren to go and restore him. And if that fails, to mark him and withdraw from him. Amen. Mark those that cause division and avoid them. You know, one of the problems that we have in the brotherhood is we don't follow that simple pr principle. And, you know, sometimes we're willing to do half of it. We'll recognize that so-and-so is in sin, but we won't avoid them. We'll ask them to come speak on our lectureship. We'll have them come in and hold a gospel meeting. As long as they don't teach their error while they're there, that's okay. But my Bible still says in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. We've gotten away from that. And the church is suffering because of that. Denominations are growing because of that. The gospel isn't being preached because of that. If we follow Brother Smith's philosophy, and I call it philosophy because it's not scripture, we would not know where to begin to reach the lost because we couldn't determine who they are because it's not even right to ask. How absurd is that? Awful. For whom did Jesus die? Does anybody know? Brother Smith doesn't know. Brother Smith doesn't even think it's appropriate to ask for whom Jesus died. Now, we're going to look at why faithful Christians can't be members of a denomination, and we'll do this as long as we have time until 
Jack comes over here and spoils my fun. <laughs> First off, denominationalism is not from God. Jesus built one church, which is his one body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And for scriptures, you can look at Matthew 16 and verse 18. That's going to be popular this week, so I'm not going to go back there. Brother Dub already mentioned it. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and verse 23. God gave Christ to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. How many bodies are there? Ephesians 4 and verse 4. There's only one. There's only one body, and the church is the body. How many churches are there? Do the math. Can you count to one? There's one body. See, I didn't even have to take my shoes off for that. I can count you. <laughs> Thank you. There's only one church. The gospel of Jesus does not condone and commend denominations. Rather, it condemns religious division. Jesus prayed for unity among believers. John 17, verse 20 and 21. Paul condemned division, admonished, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no division among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Now think about this. One is not following that's what a, a Christian is. That's what a disciple is. One is not following Jesus Christ when he practices what Jesus opposes. If God approaches, uh, approves a denomination, where's the scripture? We keep asking and we keep waiting and we keep listening and all we hear is nothing. There are no scriptures to support denominationalism. In the absence of such scriptural authority, we must conclude that God condemns the denominational arrangement and those involved in it and that practice it. Christians are disciples of Jesus. Acts 11 and verse 26. A disciple learns and follows the will of his master. In this case, again, Jesus, Luke chapter 6 and verse 40. Since Jesus never taught, endorsed, or encouraged denominationalism, one is not following Jesus when he engages in it. Colossians 3 and verse 17, Whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. So, practicing denominationalism is sin. To those in denominations, Jesus would say, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Luke chapter 6 and verse 46. Jesus, number three, Jesus adds saved people to his church, not to denominations. Acts 2 and verse 47. <clears throat> there is only one church in existence in the first century. Denominations didn't come along till hundreds of years later. Consequently, we cannot count among the saved those who teach and practice denominational false doctrines. 2 Timothy 2, verse 16 through 19. The Lord knows those who are his. Are there faithful Christians in the denominations? No. All those sincere, these people are lost. Only the gospel of Christ, not the doctrines of men, will save. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation. One of the greatest challenges facing the Lord's disciples today is sectarianism and denominationalism. The problem comes when, when one searches the scriptures and compares the church you can read about in the Bible with the churches that fill the religious world today. The fact is, all of those hundreds and even thousands of different churches in the modern day world are not even close to the New Testament church. When we think about this, there is only one church in the New Testament. Unity among believers is a lofty goal. And that's something that we ought to all be concerned about. And we ought to want all believers to be united in Christ, but not at the expense of the truth. We need to look for scriptural unity and get back to the Bible. 
and do Bible things in Bible ways and call Bible things by Bible names. That's what we need to do. We need to practice the principles of restoration that Brother Dub spoke of earlier this evening and put those into practice. Simply preach the gospel. Lead men to Christ so that they can become Christians like they were in the New Testament. You know, regarding J uh, Satan, Jesus said he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. John 8 and verse 44. You know, in that context, Jesus says, Ye are of your father the devil. That's pretty harsh, isn't it? But the fact is, if you're not of your father, Jehovah, then you're of your father the devil. That's the only two choices there are. There's no middle ground. There's no middle ground. Satan truly won a great battle and struck a mighty blow against the Lord's church and faithful Christians everywhere when he convinced the world about the lie of denominationalism. It's, it's my heart's desire and prayer that this study will help expose the lie of denominationalism and help those deceived thereby Come to a proper knowledge of the truth. You know, I write a newspaper article. comes out every Saturday in the Huntsville item. And uh, the other day I was driving by the Methodist church and they have a sign board. And it's kind of like the one y'all have out here except y'all has the truth on it. And <laughs> they said that they were truth seekers. They said, we're truth seekers. And they invited the public to ask questions. Well, you don't have to ask me twice. <laughs> and so a couple of months ago, I started running questions in the Huntsville item directed at that Methodist church. And what I would do, I would go and, and get their Methodist discipline and some of their articles of faith, and I would ask questions about that, and I would quote their material. And then I would show from the scriptures how that's false. And then, and then next week I'd come back and ask another question. Well, it wasn't long until I got an email from somebody. And, and they said, I didn't know anything at all about the Methodist church. And I, and I, I wrote back and said, you know, I know, I, need, I know everything I need to know about the Methodist church because I grew up in the Methodist church. I used to be a member of the Methodist church. I, I, when I became an adult and had my own family, we worshipped at the Methodist church, if you can call that worship. I taught Bible class as an adult. In fact, I taught Bible class so well that I studied my way out of the Methodist church. <laughs> and because the Methodist church could not answer the questions that I was asking through those newspaper articles, I left that denomination. Because I knew that when I compared the Methodist church with the church of the New Testament, it wasn't the same. And nobody in the Methodist church could explain satisfactorily from the scriptures why that was true. And so I left. I left in search of the church of the New Testament, investigating various denominations. And then one day... My wife went before me to the church of Christ. And later on, kicking and screaming, she got me to go. And when I went to the church of Christ, I said, here it is. I found the church of the New Testament. And I believe that so much that I became a gospel preacher so that I could teach other people what I learned the hard way and encourage them to become a Christian, a New Testament Christian, and a Christian only. Not part of some man-made denomination. The answers aren't there. All denominations are going to have the same problem. There's no scriptural authority for their, for, their, for their teaching, their doctrine, their existence. 
And so we in the church of Christ plead, plead desperately, plead passionately, knowing that souls are in jeopardy and that they need to come to Christ for salvation. We offer the invitation tonight. We've outlined what you need to do. Learn about Jesus Christ. The only way you can learn about Jesus Christ is study the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Learn about Jesus Christ. I want you to have faith in him. I want your faith to rest in the word of God. Not because I said something. If I say anything that I can't support from the scriptures, I don't want you to believe it. I don't want you to accept it. I want your faith to rest in this book right here. In particular, the New Testament. That's our law that we're under today. The Christian dispensation. Put your faith in Jesus Christ and then do what he says. No matter what it is. After all, he's Lord. He's the Lord. We're going to be judged by his word. You know, Jesus said, desperately trying to save those of his generation. You might reject me and receive not my word. But you have one that will judge you in that day. The word that I spoke to you, the same will judge you in that day. That gives us a little more perspective on Jesus' commandments on salvation. Repent. Luke 13, 3. He's serious about that. Turn from your sin. Confess his name. Make that good confession. It's simple. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God deity in the flesh and you know when we make that good confession it's more than just a statement of our belief it's a statement that I recognize who Jesus is and I'm going to submit my life my all to him and serve him all the days of my life and to do that I willingly confess his name before men I will submit myself to be baptized for remission of sin so my sins can be washed away in his blood. And I know when that happens, when you obey the gospel, the Lord himself will add you to his church, not a denomination. You don't want to be a member of the denominations because they're not the church of the New Testament. He's not going to add you to that. He's going to add you to his church, the one he promised to build, the one he bought with his blood, the one he promised to save. And as a Christian, do your best to live faithful. Live faithful all the days of your life. Worship and serve God and Jesus Christ, your Savior. And I guarantee you, the Bible doesn't lie. You'll have a home with Jesus and God in heaven in eternity. Isn't that what it's all about? Getting to heaven. If you're here this evening, you're subject to the invitation. Don't leave this building. And those that are on the internet watching this lesson, and those who may watch it in the future, remember, we're not ever promised tomorrow. We're only promised now. We're going to sing the invitation song. And you know, I've known people that have died in the assembly. And the Lord will come back. We don't know when. Don't put off your salvation. Come forward while we stand and sing.